before we get to uh, this lawsuit with her daughter's ex-husband and all of this madness, I do want to address Kristen Pfaff. Okay, so Kristen Pfaff, member of Hole, band with uh, Courtney Love. This is uh, something that's not really talked about a lot. I don't know why, but the uh, again, we're going to be examining the coincidence stack here because it just keeps going up. So uh, Kristen Pfaff was very talented, self-taught musician, and she was with a band, Janitor Joe, in Minneapolis. They were gaining some traction, and she was recruited to Hole by Courtney Love. And she died of a heroin overdose in her Seattle apartment in June 1994. Now, here's where it's going to get really tricky, because... Kristen Pfaff was actually very close with Kurt Cobain. According to Kristen's younger brother and other people, she would talk on the phone with him for hours and hours. Now, Kurt Cobain was notorious for not liking people and keeping to himself, but he seemed to really like Kristen. Now, Courtney Love, of course, very interesting personality type. Is she the type of egomaniacal narcissist that needs to control everyone at all times. People who, a lot of people who know her and have spoken out have said yes. Kristen Pfaff said this of Courtney Love when they were recording in Atlanta that she's just the most egomaniacal person she's ever known. And so she wants to leave Hole, go back to Minneapolis. Kurt Cobain is leaving Nirvana, leaving Seattle. What did they, they talked about a lot of things. Kurt gave her some book as a gift that uh, Courtney Love actually flipped out upon, flipped out on. So Courtney Love, of course, does not like Kristen Pfaff. Now, the, the thing that's really crazy is that Courtney Love is the one who gets, allegedly, Kristen Pfaff addicted to heroin. She gives her heroin for free. She gives her like a purse with uh, needles and and so she's her drug connection. She makes Faf think that everybody in Seattle does drugs, and that's just the way it's going to be. And it's it's actually really, the Faf story is really, really sad on so many levels because this is a very, very talented individual. She was actually gifted academically as well. I mean, she was getting scholarships and all this, and she left school to pursue a musical career. So now she's very talented at music too, talented at everything basically. And the dark side of music, of course, and not just music, but the all aspects of the entertainment industries, a lot of these uh, soft-spoken souls, we can call them, like Kurt Cobain, Kristen Pfaff, they get eaten up and chewed up and spit out by the music industry because there's so many narcissists out there. And then also, of course, the toll that drugs can take. It's all quite... Uh, it's all quite sad in its own way, especially with these... Uh, just good, so by all accounts, really good hearted and caring people that get sucked into these situations with these uh, narcissists and money, greed, drugs, all of these things. So, there are things that don't add up about the FAF story. So, she's actually, uh, so she's from Minneapolis and she was, uh, she formed the band Janitor Joe. So Janet and Joe was doing pretty well. They were getting a lot of attention, and they were in California in 1993, and Faf was noticed by Eric Erlinson and Courtney Love of the band Hole, who were looking for a new bassist. Love invited Faf to play with Hole. Faf declined, returned to Minneapolis, but Erlinson and Love continued to pursue her. Faf, reluctant to leave Minneapolis and join Hole, reconsidered after advice from her father or stepfather, Norman. From a professional point of view, there was no decision, he told Seattle Weekly, because they're already on Geffen Records and already have this huge following in England. If you're wanting to move up the ladder, that's the way to go. Although Kristen's mother, Janet, was more reluctant for her daughter to leave Minneapolis and Janet or Joe in favor of Seattle and Hull. Following international critical acclaim for their first independent album, Pretty on the Inside, Hull had generated a great deal of major label interest, eventually signing an eight-album deal with Geffen Records for a reported $3 million. 
In 1993, Pfaff moved to Seattle, Washington to work with other members of Hole on Live Through This, the major label follow-up to Pretty on the Inside. The band's new lineup, Love, Erlinson, Pfaff, and Patty Schemmel, on drums, entered the studio in early 93 to begin rehearsals. That's when we took off, Eric Erlinson said, of Pfaff joining. All of a sudden, we became a real band. Now... Coming to Seattle, of course, she's a young woman. She, it's, it's a new city, crazy city, new job. So she actually entered a relationship with Eric Erlinson, who was later her dealer. Uh, initially, supposedly by all accounts, Courtney Love was the one that got her hooked, and either through Eric Erlinson or in addition to. And she entered the relationship with him I believe her younger brother or one of her friends, her friend from Minneapolis, said it was because he was like the, the he was the first guy <laughs> that she was around in Seattle, and it was mostly just a vulnerable point. So that's that was her go to. It wasn't really uh, a love based relationship, so to speak. So this guy Eric Erlinson, who actually ended up showing up to her funeral after her parents said they didn't want anybody from Hole there or any of these dark influences on their daughter, rightfully so. In Minneapolis, she was clean and happy with her friends. And then if you look at photographs of her in Seattle uh, with people around her doing a lot of drugs, she did a lot of drugs herself. Of course, uh, peer pressure is a very real thing for a lot of people, especially when there's a certain acceptancy or commonality or, or just the perception that drugs are just part of the scene, which obviously there was a lot of that back then in Seattle. So it this Erlinson guy, it's it's weird. He actually ended up dating Drew Barrymore. And Drew Barrymore actually got Courtney Love some Hollywood additional Hollywood movie roles. So some people think this is just one of entertainment industry's just dark secrets. Because they don't want to out Courtney Love, so to speak, because there's so much there's so many intertwining threads here. It would just look bad for the whole for the industry as a whole. And there are so many parties that this touches again the multi-billion dollar brand that nirvana was and could be if cobain dies as opposed to moves on becomes an indie artist or just goes into obscurity or whatnot yeah it's 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 really hard but with with faf she also became close with kurt cobain which obviously courtney love did not like the control freak that she was so what it's weird because again, Wikipedia and all of these official sources, they kind of peddle the official narrative that's been formed here because with all of these more in-depth accounts and how people paint Courtney Love as this narcissistic, egomaniacal user of people and drugs and getting her way, she does not do well with rejection. So what initially Faf only joined whole conditionally it was just for the album and for the summer tour then she was going back to uh, janitor joe now of course how does it look especially with everybody liked faf the band was successful she's gonna leave the band mostly because of courtney and so rejecting courtney and the band and then courtney's husband's doing the same thing he's getting divorced leaving seattle leaving his band everybody's leaving courtney would she be able to handle it and the coincidence stack is going to get a whole lot higher so of course uh, uh seattle was known as washington's heroin capital so erlinson says this so again with the spin that wiki promotes here courtney love says this Everybody was doing it. Everyone, everyone. All our friends were junkies. It was ridiculous. Everyone in this town did dope, said love of this period in the Seattle music scene, which of course is not true. Not every, you know, there, there were bands who were clean. By most accounts, Faf's own drug use was relatively moderate. Kristen dabbled in drugs before she was in our band in Minneapolis, but it was very light. Erlinson told Craig Marks of Spin. And I don't know if anybody's verified that. And by that, by light, what does that mean? Does that mean marijuana? She moved to Seattle and felt disconnected from everything. And she made friends, drug connections, which I told her not to. <laughs> this is what Erlinson is saying. Because I Is that because he's her drug? He wants to be her exclusive drug connection? The only way you can survive in this town is if you don't make those connections. After the critical acclaim of Holes lived through this album, Faf decided to move back to Minneapolis, partly because of her drug problem and partly because of creative differences with Hole. 
And that, again, th this is just a really brief summary on Wikipedia that doesn't go into the details that this was all conditional uh, issues with Courtney Love. Pfaff entered a Minneapolis detox center for heroin addiction in February 1994 and left Hull later that spring to tour with Janitor Joe. She went on tour, and when she came back from that, she was clean, says Erlinson. In the wake of Cobain's death in April 1994, Pfaff decided to leave Hull and return to Minneapolis permanently. After her tour with Janitor Joe, however, Pfaff made plans to return to Seattle in order to retrieve the rest of her belongings, making the trip to Seattle on June 14th, 1994. Death. On June 16th, 1994, at around 9.30 a.m., Pfaff was found dead in her Seattle apartment by Paul Erickson, a friend with whom she had planned to leave for Minneapolis that day. The day she's leaving from Minneapolis, she's found dead. She was 27 years old. Again, the coincidence stack just keeps getting higher and higher. On the floor was a bag containing syringes and drug paraphernalia. Fast death was attributed to acute opiate intoxication. She died two months after Cobain, who was a close friend, as well as the husband of Hull's front woman, Courtney Love. Her father, Norman Pfaff, described her as bright, personable, wonderful, very, very talented and smart, and she always seemed to be in control of her circumstances. Last night, she wasn't. In the book Love and Death, released April 2004, Kristen Pfaff's mother, Janet Pfaff, states she has never accepted the official story regarding her daughter's death. Janet was interviewed by authors Wallace and Halperin in August 2008. You know what's weird? Kurt Cobain aside, like just the Kristen Pfaff, just on the surface, there's something fishy about this whole story. I mean, even without factoring in Kurt Cobain. Eric Erlinson, the last person to see Pfaff alive before she overdosed on heroin, would later comment, I admit I made some stupid mistakes with some people, and people are dead because of my stupid mistakes. That's what I want to say, and I want to use that so that other people don't make the same mistakes that I made, and other people start understanding. I get emotional about this. We've all lost people. Who's he talking about? But anyway, is it coincidental that Eric Erlinson, another uh, a, a member of the band Hole, which she Faf is leaving, technically not on good terms, so to speak. I mean, she even made comments to a, to a magazine or a media outlet that uh, she couldn't get off the ground in Seattle. The scene was stagnant, etc. I mean, I'm sure Courtney Love read that, and um, she, she might have not liked it. And then she was getting really, really close with Kurt Cobain. Courtney Love's husband with these multi-hour long conversations on the phone. Kurt is giving her treasured books as gifts. Courtney is not liking that. And believe it or not, we're just getting started with the coincidence stack regarding Faf. I'm going to read part of an article from uh, hauntedpublications.com, The Peculiar Death of Kristen Faf, What You Need to Know, written by Emily Lyman, July 10th, 2019. So there's a brief intro on her background. So basically, she was 21 years old when she learned how to play the bass guitar. And shortly after uh, the article begins, on June 16th, 1994, Kristen Pfaff was found dead in the bathtub of her Seattle, Washington apartment. What ensued would be a peculiar series of events, each more confusing than the last. In order to better understand this case and each puzzling detail, it's important to truly understand who Kristen Pfaff was, musically and personally. Kristen Marie Pfaff was born May 26, 1967 in Amherst, New York, a suburb of Buffalo in the western part of the state. She was the only child of her mother's marriage, which ended in divorce when Pfaff was very young. Her mother, Janet, remarried to Norman Pfaff, whom Kristen was adopted by. She later took his last name. Growing up, she was trained in classical piano and cello. In 85, Kristen graduated from the Buffalo Academy of the Sacred Heart, a private Catholic high school. She relocated to Europe for a brief time, but eventually returned to America to study in Boston, Massachusetts. Shortly after, she moved once more to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and enrolled at the University of Minnesota. It was here at age 21, 
Kristen learned how to play the bass guitar. While living in Minneapolis, Kristen formed her first band, Janitor Joe, in 92. The band released their debut single the same year and their debut album, Big Metal Birds, one year later in 1993. Janitor Joe was formed alongside guitarist, vocalist Joaquin Brewer and drummer Matt Ensminger. During a Janitor Joe performance in California, Courtney Love and Eric Erlinson found Kristen Pfaff and her life was changed forever. The duo's band, Hole, were scouting out a female bassist as they had just lost theirs, Jill Emery. Love asked Pfaff to join Hole, but she refused and returned to Minnesota. However, Love and Erlinson were persistent that she fill Emery's space in Hole. Eventually, Pfaff agreed and moved to Seattle, Washington in order to join Hole. In early 93, Pfaff began rehearsing with Hole in preparation of their second studio album, Live Through This. During her time in Seattle, Kristen began using heroin, most likely due to her inner circle of friends all being users. And again, I'm just going to add here again, if it's true that Courtney Love was the one that was giving her heroin for free, that's always a red flag. Getting people hooked when you're their only source for the drug, that means somebody is trying to control you. It is reported that Pfaff hated Seattle and eagerly longed to return to Minneapolis. Pfaff told a reporter with the University of Minnesota newspaper what she allegedly told her whole bandmates. Look, if you want me to be happy and sane, I just need to get back home. Home was not the New York suburb where she was raised. Rather, it was Minneapolis where she attended college and was heavily involved in the city's music scene. After nearly a year in Seattle, she left to return to Minnesota in March of 1994. In April, she returned for friend Kurt Cobain's funeral, and in June, she returned one final time to collect the remainder of her belongings. Kristen never returned from that June trip to Seattle. In an interview with the Buffalo News following Kristen's death, her mother Janet recalls an incident in February of 1994, where she rushed to Seattle following her daughter had what she called an incident that led to her hospitalization. In this brief time in her life, for the first time, Kristen had a fling with drugs, Janet Pfaff told the Buffalo News. I think it was peer pressure. I think it was part of a music scene in Seattle where drug use is glamorized and emphasized. Janet said her daughter was not a regular drug user or addict by any means. Following the death of Cobain, Janet said her and her daughter talked regularly and states that her daughter struggled with the passing of somebody so close to her. It is reported that following Cobain's passing, Pfaff entered a depression. It's also been reported that the, the day of Cobain, the day she learned of Cobain's death, she, she never did drugs after that point. Many circumstances surrounding Fast death are extremely suspicious. Before we dive into, that, into the peculiar details, let it be known that this article is simply stating the strange facts of the case and is no way intending to accuse anybody of being responsible for Kristen Pfaff's death. Prior to her death, Pfaff had finished a drug rehab program to help her combat her heroin problem. The plan was to return to Minneapolis, as stated earlier. Kristen was only in Seattle to collect the last of her things to bring back with her. A packed U-Haul was outside the apartment at the time of her death. The last person to see her alive was boyfriend and fellow, or ex-boyfriend, and fellow whole member Eric Erlinson. Also, her main drug connection. That's not part of the article. <laughs> I just added that. Suspiciously, while talking about the death of his ex-girlfriend, Kristen Pfaff, er Erlinson is quoted as saying, I admit I made some stupid mistakes with some people, and people are dead because of my stupid mistakes. And again, we, we can postulate that Kristen Pfaff might not be the only individual he is talking about, and the mistake being, what did he do? Did Courtney Love put him up to something? to make Kristen Pfaff OD? Is, is this how Courtney Love dresses up all of these murders if she's going around committing these murders or attempting to? Pfaff was found dead in a bathroom in her Seattle apartment, the one which she was making a final trip to in order to pack up her belongings by friend Paul Erickson. 
Drug paraphernalia was found on the scene, the presence of which automatically changed how the scene was analyzed. Without much of a second look, police had decided Kristen overdosed, despite the fact that multiple sources claimed she was doing much better. I mean, this is almost the same MO as Kurt Cobain. Was he even using drugs anymore? Are these people recovered and moving away from Courtney Love's circle of influence? And how would an egomaniacal narcissist handle that? Because again, it's not just about them and it being personal. It's about how the world perceives it. Courtney Love, how what what would she be thinking? Her husband wants to divorce her. Not only that, but remove her from the will. They have a prenup. She's not getting any of his money ever. And he could be worth billions by the time his career is over. Or same amount dead. Possibly more dead. And also their bassist in the, or Courtney Love's bassist in her band hole, she doesn't want to be around Courtney Love either. They're both leaving her at the same time. How would an egomaniacal narcissist respond to that? I don't know. Courtney Love's own father doesn't think very well. To put it bluntly, Kristen's autopsy was a joke, but there are some important points that need to be made regarding it. The autopsy was performed by Dr. Nicholas Hawthorne, a coroner who conveniently also performed Kurt Cobain's autopsy and was close friends with Courtney Love. So apparently this is somebody who, was this an ex-boyfriend of Courtney Love, some kind of music promoter, they went bar hopping, who knows what the deal was there, but this was this is all known, this is not a theory. And so I actually have come across another theory that might explain some of these issues involving the police and the coroner and both of these highly suspicious deaths when you're factoring in all of these coincidences and anomalies. So you'll have to wait a little bit for that mind shock. Let me finish up with this. If you recall, Kurt Cobain's death was ruled a suicide despite some suspicious circumstances that lead some to believe he was possibly murdered. Love's close relationship to Dr. Hawthorne also make things, makes things complicated, as the autopsy report could have potentially been biased. An immediate cause of death could not be determined by the preliminary autopsy. Hawthorne stated it was a classic suicide comparable to that of Cobain's. This is where the case of the autopsy gets more suspicious. Pfaff's body was found in a room with drug paraphernalia. The police believed she overdosed, and Dr. Hawthorne believed that was the method used for Pfaff to commit suicide. However, there is no record of a toxicology report being conducted. If it was believed Kristen Pfaff overdosed on drugs, why wouldn't they perform a toxicology? It would be crucial information to know what was in her system at the time of her death. The drugs in her system and the concentration of them would better help establish a cause of death for Pfaff. The only explanation for Dr. Hawthorne not performing a toxicology report would be him knowing some damning information regarding Courtney Love and her relation to Pfaff's death. This information could have been kept secret by the lack of a toxicology report. Of course, if no or an excess amount of heroin was found in her bloodstream, the death would automatically become suspicious in the eyes of investigators. Is it possible Dr. Hawthorne bypassed an autopsy and gave Kristen a seemingly obvious cause of death to save somebody else's reputation, rather love herself or somebody in her close circle? And so just looking at the M.O. here, the possible M.O. of Courtney Love, if this is her doing and not somebody else, there could be somebody else in their circle. Again, I'm not claiming to know everything about this case. I do not. I am just looking over this. The rabbit holes have gone much farther than I anticipated. We are now in hour four of this podcast, making this the longest mind shock on record. <laughs> And we're not even done yet because there, there's a lot of problems here. But is this that M.O.? Because the, um, the DeWitt, Callie DeWitt, did Courtney Love put him up to uh, murdering Cobain? And now is she using Eric Erlinson to take out Faf? Now, er Erlinson, supposedly he moved on, but who knows? 
Uh, on some level, he must know that she never really, really loved him. I mean, some of this stuff is just innate. Maybe she even admitted it to him. We don't really know. We're not privy to their personal conversations. If he was holding a grudge, or even not, even if he was still hopelessly in love with her, the power of Courtney Love and the manipulation and influence by all accounts that she seems to be exhibiting over all of these people. I mean, they went, again, this doesn't prove a lot. Certain bands have trouble with, I mean, usually it's the drummer, <laughs> but Hole had several bassists leave and a drummer. Summer. people just can't handle Courtney Love for what reason is that I don't know like it's it's all and now she's like over time she became kind of a staple of the industry if she knows compromising information about other major moguls they would protect her because if they don't she's taking them down with her again th these are kind of if this theory is true if Kurt Cobain really didn't commit suicide, if, and, and maybe, maybe he did and Kristen Pfaff was set up and she was, because she's even more mysterious to me. There's even more evidence of Pfaff's, the Pfaff storyline not adding up, but obviously they're just intertwined. The timeline, you cannot ignore the timeline. They're both leaving Courtney Love and the Seattle scene and their spheres of influence. It's interesting. It's very, very interesting. And supposedly Kurt Cobain actually bought two plane tickets to Atlanta. Were they planning on, a, uh, on some kind of collaboration? And would someone like Courtney Love be able to handle that? The plot thickens even further. Kristen's full autopsy report was never released to the public. It has been 24 years since her death. Courtney Love is the main suspect in the death of Kristen Pfaff. With holes in her story, I don't think that was an intended pun, a hole in Courtney Love's story, many holes, a turbulent past between the two and Love's intense paranoia, she certainly fits the profile. According to reports, Courtney was obsessed with the idea that Kurt Cobain was cheating on her. On April 1st, 1994, shortly before his death, Cobain had bought two round-trip airline tickets for him and another female besides Love. Apparently, Love thought this mystery woman of Kurt's was possibly Kristen Pfaff. Multiple reports say Courtney thought Kurt was having an affair with Kristen, though the pairing claimed they were only good friends. Kurt has been quoted as saying, she's a expletive, talented musician. She's also a beautiful soul. I think she's so beautiful. But if I ever told her that and Courtney found out, it would be hell about Kristen. So before I even said, would jealousy be a good motive for Courtney Love, someone who's already rich and famous, they, they don't need particularly need Kurt Cobain to, to live, necessarily. <laughs> Although, who knows how expensive the, all the various drug habits and the lifestyle is. I mean, I guess they do if they want to support the lifestyle. Maybe she does. I don't know. But now you have not only Kurt Cobain ending up dead, but someone who Kurt Cobain possibly was associated with, or even Courtney Love suspected that he liked Faf, regardless of if anything happened there. But she knew there, there were already blowouts regarding Kurt Cobain and Faf. They both end up dead within a month of each other, all coming on the tail end of Cobain wanting a divorce, and Cobain and Faf both leaving the Seattle area, and leaving Courtney Love's circle. I mean, how many coincidences can we stack? I mean, I, I, I might actually stack a few more. <laughs> According to multiple sources, including Faf's own brother, Jason, Kristen feared Courtney greatly. At the time of her death, Kristen was in the process of leaving Hull. She had rekindled her relationship with her janitor Joe bandmates and was excited about returning to Minneapolis to possibly start their career again. Overall, Kristen's attitude of returning to the city she called home was positive. She seemed excited. However, Courtney Love was most likely not as thrilled. It was reported that Kristen was just taking a break from Hull, but why would she abandon the city of her bandmates, take a U-Haul full of her stuff back to Minneapolis, and restart a relationship with her old bandmates if it was just a break? It is important to note that like the death of Kurt Cobain, Kristen Pfaff died while she was separating herself from Courtney Love. And just again, regarding... Regarding Faf, uh, Courtney Love painted the picture that Faf was just on break or whatever, 
that she didn't leave the band. Again, she didn't want that negative press. She didn't want that reflected badly on her, even though she knew Faf was not coming back. And I believe they also had another bassist lined up. So, yeah, so again, Courtney loves flat-out lying and manipulation of the media to kind of push forward a certain persona that she wanted to portray for her own gain is evident every step of the way here. Does that mean she's a murderer? No. But it is, again, it's it's just, it's it's convenient. It's definitely convenient if she were a murderer. I mean, it, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. If you're still with us, going past hour four now, feel free to jump in with your thoughts. In December 1994, Courtney Love gave an interview to Rolling Stone magazine, which was just all the more confusing and did not make much sense. She stated, quote, I had to go over there and get Eric away from the body. Kristen had been his lover for a really long time. He'd already broken down the bathroom door for her. Although if you remember, it wasn't Eric Erlinson that found Kristen. It was friend Paul Erickson. So it wasn't Eric, it was Paul. Additionally, the initial police report from the scene does not mention Courtney's presence at all. Or Eric's, does it? Huh. When Janet Pfaff, Kristen's mother, received her daughter's belongings post-mortem, she noticed something quite odd. Every day, Kristen journaled before falling asleep. Her journal contained truly the deepest parts of herself. When Kristen's diary was returned to her mother, multiple pages were torn from it. These missing entries were the ones during the week of time when Kurt Cobain was missing before his body was found. Rather, Kristen Courtney or somebody else tore those pages out will remain a mystery forever. All right, so here's another coincidence stack. Here's another coincidence to add to the stack. So coincidentally, her private thoughts about what occurred in the days before Kurt Cobain's death are gone, vanished. What did they say? See, if Courtney was there when Faf's body, if she put up Eric Erlinson or Courtney were responsible, if they OD'd her or whatever, made her look like an OD suicide when in fact it was not, did she find the journal and rip those pages out because she didn't like what they said? Were they accusatory of Courtney? Did Kurt Cobain tell Kristen something about Courtney or that he that he feared for his life and that Courtney would be responsible? Because he was t allegedly he was telling these uh, investment individuals from Michigan who he met with, if that's true, uh, days before his death that he was fearing for his life. Who did he think was coming after him? Is it possible? That it wasn't necessarily Courtney Love by her own volition, but maybe she was manipulated or blackmailed by other people. And they it, it's easy, you know, if they're her drug source, drug provider, or affiliated with such individuals, or if they could possibly be in charge of ruining her career or terminating it if they didn't go along with what they said. Is it possible some kind of music exec put her up to setting all of this in motion? And because, I mean, clearly, again, with the recordings with... Uh, with Courtney Love's and Kurt Cobain's lawyer, Carol, where she states that, you know, she wants this vicious divorce attorney and she wants to get rid of, somehow invalidate the prenup. So she really doesn't seem to care much about Kurt Cobain anymore at this point, except in public or when the cameras are rolling. But it's, it's, it's very strange. It's very, very strange. There's also, before I forget, there's also a clip of Courtney Love and Eric Erlinson. It's some kind of behind-the-scenes footage from, from a, some kind of program relating to their band. And she actually makes a joke. Relate, so Eric Erlinson says something about drugs and how, and it's just, it's bad. And she makes a joke, or like he can't get off of them or whatever. She, Courtney Love viciously, emotionlessly, makes a joke, didn't your ex-girlfriend die from heroin or something? She's talking about Kristen Pfaff, and she doesn't even name her as her, this is her bandmate, and she refers to her simply as an ex-girlfriend of Erlinson, and she's almost got a half smile, like, she, she, it's almost like she's reveling in the viciousness of that statement, especially if she knows that Eric Erlinson actually loved her more than anybody, 
And if she actually put him up to murdering her, that would just be, I mean, it, it's a really bizarre clip. I'm going to throw it up right now so you guys can check it out. I think I was wearing these Eric's pants. Eric's the most insecure one. No, I think they're purple. No, and I don't think about it. No, they're green cords. <laughs> yeah, but you latched onto my arrogance. I hate and your she arrogance. Yeah, but you too. used it and created it to your own, your own arrogance. Oh, that's right. I'm <laughs> arrogant. You're right. It rubs well, off on you. Watch out for arrogance. It rubs off on you. You would have quit when your girlfriend died. But it's really weird. I mean, everything from not using her name to the vicious pleasure she seemed to have gotten from making that crack at Eric. And I mean, obviously, they've probably got so much dirt on each other, they would never really blow the whistle on each other. Who knows? I mean, maybe one day they will if they get pissed off at each other. But it's that's the thing with a lot of these conspiracies, criminal conspiracies involving big industries or big money. If people have dirt on each other, there's vested interest not to blow the whistle because they could take them down with you. So unless you're prepared, if you're in one of their situations, you have to be prepared to go down in flames for everything you've done if you want to expose somebody else. And that's a lot of reasons some of these conspiracies stay hidden. I mean, a lot of coincidence theorists don't understand that aspect of it. Okay. Multiple suspicious details surround the death of Kristen Pfaff. Every person in Kristen's immediate, immediate family, including her brother, mother, and father, do not believe Kristen overdosed as the police and coroner state. As far as everybody knew, Kristen was doing great and rehab had helped her kick her heroin addiction. Some believe Kristen was given a hot shot, an especially potent bit of pure heroin, which is almost always lethal. Others believe Kristen was murdered and the drug paraphernalia was placed by Paul Erickson upon discovering Faf's body. Ra Why Paul Erickson? He was her friend going to Minneapolis. Was he in on it? Or was it more likely that it was Eric Erlinson? This is her article, so that's what maybe she, maybe it's a typo, I don't know. Rather, this was a true overdose or something more sinister, we will never know. The only people who truly know what happened to Kristen Pfaff are herself and any others involved, rather innocently or in a more sinister way. I, I think that's a bit, I don't know, that's a bit nihilistic. I think we can know. I think there's enough information here, and if enough awareness is brought forward, because a lot of people talk about Kurt Cobain. On one hand, you say, oh, well, you couldn't find out what happened to Kurt Cobain. I don't know. Kristen Pfaff wasn't as big of a moneymaker as Kurt Cobain. There might be less to lose, but of course, since it's connected to Kurt Cobain in a certain way, if it could be discovered without the connection or possibly giving immunity to parties responsible if they were also involved in Kurt Cobain's death— it might, it, it can be done, you know, never, never say never. But it's, yeah, this, this, just on the surface, it's already more fishy than, uh, than Kurt Cobain, but because they're intertwined, it's even more fishy. The day that she's leaving, the U-Haul is outside. She's going to shoot up. Everything's ready to go. She's excited to get back with uh, Janet or, J or, I mean, technically she never left. I, I don't know the exact circumstances, but the whole gig was supposed to be uh, temporary anyway, right off the bat. So, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. So five days prior to her death from her journal, according to buffalonews.com, I'll write it on my sleeve. She would say in her journal, I know how to live. Five days later, Faf was dead. One does have to note with a lot of these music industry or entertainment industry conspiracies where there's drugs involved, if you're thinking ahead, I mean, getting somebody hooked on drugs is kind of convenient because then if you do want to take them out of the picture at some point, you could just hot shot time, drug overdose, boom, make it, make it look like a suicide. Nobody knows better or not, or just accidental. Awfully convenient, especially if there's a pattern and we seem, I mean... It's tough. It's tough to just write everything off as a coincidence. So here's another Reddit post on Kristen Pfaff. This was posted on Reddit. Apparently the circumstances of her death are as follows. She had her U-Haul packed and was ready to leave early the next morning. That night she took a bath and Eric Erlinson came by. Later on, her roommate heard her snoring in the bathtub, so he went to bed. The next morning, the bathroom door was still locked and he had to break it in 
and found her dead in the tub of a heroin overdose. Why? Wait. Huh. Now here's where it gets murky. Courtney claims that she had to drag Eric away from Kristen's body, yet she and Eric weren't there that morning when Kristen's roommate broke in the door. Tom Grant's theory is that Courtney supplied Eric with the heroin and he stopped by to see Kristen and give her a present of one last hit. The heroin, which was also three times the lethal level, was purer than usual and Kristen died. Eric panicked and called Courtney and they cleaned up and left. Murder, very possible. Eric may have been used as a patsy. This is all just theory, but remember, Courtney and Kristen didn't get along. Courtney was heard telling Kristen, first you make eyes at my husband. Now you're telling me how to sing. Do not expletive with me or you will live to regret it. Again, it comes down to the question, was Kristen the other woman? It's obvious from Kurt's remark about her being a talented musician and a beautiful soul that there was an attraction between the two. When Kurt died, Kristen was distraught and determined to get away from Courtney. She never made it. Murder or accident, you decide. Well, it's also kind of interesting because it seems like they're polar opposites, Courtney Love and Kristen Pfaff, because Kristen Pfaff remarked that uh, Courtney Love was all about the, the glamour and making money and the lifestyle, whereas Kristen just wanted to make the music. So obviously Kristen had a lot more in common with Kurt Cobain than Courtney. So here is another... Uh, this is an article here. Did the FBI investigate Courtney Love for the death of Kristen Pfaff? Off and on for several years, an anonymous poster had posted comments to online boards and forums claiming that she was the ex-girlfriend of Jason Pfaff, Kristen Pfaff's brother. Kristen Pfaff was the original bassist for Hole and died about two months after Kurt Cobain. According to this anonymous poster, Jason Pfaff allegedly told her that after her sister died, the FBI came out and interviewed him for hours. Interestingly, Jason allegedly claimed that the FBI seemed to be focused on Courtney Love and spent the time asking questions about her and her relationship to Kristen. Was the FBI secretly investigating Courtney Love? The Pfaff family rejects the official cause of death from the SPD. The Pfaff family has gone on record saying they believe that Courtney Love had something to do with Kristen's death. Courtney Love and Kristen Pfaff fought constantly. Courtney Love constantly accused her of sleeping with Kurt Cobain. Finally, when the SPD returned the possessions of Kristen to her mother, her mother discovered that her diary had been tampered with. The pages for the week that Kurt went was missing and up to when his body was discovered had been torn out. It makes one wonder what information was included in those missing pages. So normally I would say we need like we need all that satellite footage of the exterior of the apartment in Seattle, but I don't know, 94 is a lot tougher. I'm not sure what kind of surveillance they had. For any cases, I mean, going into the 2000s, it seems like it'd be there. I don't know. That's a lot tougher. 1994. Were there gas stations around? Was there security footage? Was that looked into? Because if Courtney Love is in that area, I mean, that would be pretty crazy. Or even Eric Erland, sir because supposedly he's not supposed to be there either. One of the posts from uh, allegedly an ex-girlfriend said regarding Jason Pfaff, he did believe that Courtney Love likely played a part in his sister's death. He believed that his sister knew what part Courtney played in Kurt's death. I mean, how high is the coincidence stack already? I mean, I don't know what to, it's, it's just, it's tough. It's tough to dismiss all of this. And it, again, if you go, if you remember at the beginning of the podcast, I thought that this would probably be one of the cases that was probably overblown in terms of conspiracy talk, because there's so many around so many famous people. But the more you look at the case, when you factor in Kristen Pfaff, it looks worse and worse. And by the way, the reference to I had to go over there and get Eric away from the body uh, that Courtney Love stated, because supposedly Courtney and Erlinson weren't supposed to be there. It was Paul Erickson who discovered the body in the morning. This is from Rolling Stone, December 1994. So it is not some random obscure claim. It's, it's from a major magazine quoting her. 
I mean, that's kind of crazy that she said it and it was printed. But then again, a lot more supposedly p people that have been following this more closely than I have, have noticed some Freudian slips, body language, micro expression issues throughout the years. So again, it comes down to this. You have Kurt Cobain wanting to leave his band of Nirvana, which Courtney Love was directly profiting from. They have a kid together, etc., and he wants to divorce her, and she gets nothing because of the prenup. He doesn't get to do it. He doesn't get to escape. And then inside two months, you also have Kristen Pfaff wanting to escape Courtney Love, the band hole. And possibly, at least Courtney Love suspected she was involved with Kurt, whether she was or wasn't. I mean, they were definitely at least friends who liked each other. We know that uh, and in some capacity. It is kind of crazy, though. There's a lot more evidence here, even against Courtney, than there is of Stephen Avery. <laughs> I mean, or even Scott Peterson. It's just, it's crazy. Uh, it's it's really crazy. I know some people are going to find those controversial if you haven't checked out the Mindshock Stephen Avery series or, or the Scott Peterson. I'm not saying he's innocent in any way. But Scott Peterson, Avery, there's really no evidence against him, but... Yeah, you you do have. I mean, it's 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 mostly circumstantial. There's nothing. There's not hard evidence here. I'm not saying Courtney Love would be proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. Uh, obviously, there's the, just the fishy business regarding everything. It's so fishy. We're approaching four and a half hours here in the longest Mindshock podcast I've done, but there's still more to go over. And this is Mindshock, so. Hopefully you guys had a coffee handy if you're if you're listening to this in one shot. But yeah, here's here's the thing. I'm about to go down two deep, deep conspiracy rabbit holes, even deeper than I've previously gone down, just because a lot of this information, it's just it's way too difficult to ignore. It's too difficult, particularly if anybody's done any research into the drug scene and other issues regarding police and CIs. That is the next thing I'm going to tackle. Some people believe that Courtney Love was a CI for Seattle PD, and that's why she was protected. So a couple different, uh, I mean, this theory can involve a couple different scenarios. Either Courtney Love was already involved in the drug scene, they recruited her, and she was giving up dealers or whoever, maybe some bigger power players. So at that point, she could do whatever she wants. And if she's got an in with the coroner who used to be one of her best buds, she could take these people out. They're not going to touch her over two murders if they're, if they're going after bigger fish that are killing a lot more people, possibly some mob connections, possibly government connections. Who knows what the deal is? There were issues there. So if she's a CI, would she be protected? Would she get away with it? Would she take advantage of it? Again, what happens when you add jealousy to the table? People's egos and jealousy on top of the money. It's not just the jealousy. I mean, any one of these motives has been used to kill people. But now stack all the motives. That's a lot of motives. So the people that say she had no motive... Clearly, she had several motives. <laughs> now, whether she did it or not, again, separate issue. So that's one of the scenarios. The CI scenario explains quite a lot. It explains the shadiness with the police. It explains why there weren't really investigations into either one of these murders, Cobain or Fafs. Okay, so the last rabbit hole I'm going to go down is, uh, it's dark. It's really, really dark. Actually, uh, I found another post from an, an investigator, allegedly. If he's not lying on Reddit, I've been a homicide investigator for four years now, and I would bet a year's pay that she either did it or had it done. I believed it was her when it happened, and everything I've learned only makes it more convinced that she did it. So he believed it was her before he became a police officer, homicide investigator. And he said, everything I've learned only makes me more convinced that she did it. I have seen multiple suicides, but I have never seen an addict use a gun when there was enough dope to do the job. That's the first thing that struck me. The second was that he had so much dope in his system, he should have been in and out of consciousness. Junkies call it nodding out, and it can make them extremely vulnerable. I just don't see someone who is that expletive up being able to shoot himself with a shotgun, much less wanting to. Nodding out is pretty much the goal for an opiate addict, and it's not a state of mind that lends itself to suicidal impulses. 
If he had been in withdrawal, I would believe it, but he wasn't. If you asked me, she hired someone to do it, and that someone has been smart enough to remain silent all this time. She made a good choice. I can't help wondering if the killer will come clean on his deathbed or something like that. Someone else chimed in here. Seriously, I'm not a professional by any means, but I've lived in states with huge heroin problems. And heroin addicts never shoot themselves with a gun over a needle. In terms of pain, quickness, chance of mistake, a lethal heroin shot is much quicker than a gunshot. Another heartbreaking post reads this, it's sad that a lot of people who are most likely involved directly in killing him, junkie friends and hangers on, were considered intimates that he trusted. It's known that these parties were supplying him with dope while he was in hiding after leaving rehab just before his death, and they were also in Courtney's camp. It's not inconceivable these fellow drug addicts would have carried out whatever Courtney had asked them to with the promise that she would later compensate them. And besides that, it would be easier and a better selling point to make it seem like he was a tortured artist than being murdered by close associates. And easier for law enforcement to close the book on it. Everyone wins except for the guy that got killed. Actually, I want to go over, since, since we're making this a long one, I might as well go over another article I found very interesting. And uh, if this guy is one of Courtney Love's lackeys, Eric Erlinson, of course, if he took part in at least Faf's death, if not Cobain's, this interview is quite interesting. Eric Erlinson talks about letters to Kurt, whole guitarist takes account of a dark and turbulent period by Steve Appleford. April 8th, 2012. It's afternoon in a downtown Los Angeles loft, and Eric Erlinson is about to share some new music. The former whole guitarist slips a blank CD into his laptop and burns a copy of the raw instrumental demos he recorded to accompany his first book, the prose poem memoir, Letters to Kurt. Which is quite sick if he was involved, but I don't know. He then scrawls a confrontational title onto the disc, Contempt to Tape. Then again, he wouldn't be the first guy to write a book if he was directly involved, pretending not to be. So, Nearly two decades after the 94 suicide of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain, Erlinson looks just as he did at the height of grunge. Tall, thin, stringy blonde hair to his shoulders, Letters to Kurt is his accounting of that turbulent time looking back with rage and affection for an era of great creative successes and a crushing wave of heroin and death. We were in the middle of that creative energy that was happening, Erlinson remembers, but at the same time, he tells Rolling Stones, quote, I was in the abyss. I, was qu I quite literally had one foot in, one foot out. The one foot out was my anchor, which is my Buddhism, but sometimes I'd feel too clean and I'd want to get dirty. There's different forms of suicide. When you're playing around with drugs, it's a pretty clear suicide death wish, end quote. Now that's interesting phrasing. So if he's trying to play it off like Cobain and Faf were just, they were both uh, just uh, heroin addicts with a death wish. N nothing to see here. No reason to investigate foul play of any kind for any reason. Continuing with the article, he saw the self-destruction and depression up close, not just of Cobain, but also in whole bassist Kristen Faf, who died two months after the Nirvana leader. She was Erlinson's ex-girlfriend, and he was the last person to see her before her heroin overdose, or alleged heroin overdose, soon after the release of Holes Live Through This. You know what's interesting, though? Again, what, if someone's murdered, usually the person that did it, well, <laughs> I mean, I would say if they were murdered, the person that did it is the last person that they saw, obviously. In a lot of cases, it's also the last known person to have seen them, which happened to be this man. Eric Erlinson. You know someone's suicidal, you know someone's playing with death, but you don't know how to deal with it. You re don't really know what's going on until somebody defines it for you in a clear way where you get it, says Erlinson. I admit I made some stupid mistakes with some people, and people are dead because of my stupid mistakes. That's what I want to say. And I want to use that so that other people don't make the same mistakes that I made and other people start understanding. I get emotional about this. We've all lost people. Is that a way to deflect? There are other revelations from the opening pages of his book, including his romantic relationship with whole leader Courtney Love before her marriage to Cobain. 
Even other members of Hull were unaware of it until much later. She buried it. She would never talk about it. She would always skip it, he says. She's going to brush it off and say it didn't happen. At a certain age, you grow up and you have to say this happened. I did this. I did that. What else did you do? The impact on his life continues, he says. There was a relationship and it was very profound because it changed my life on so many levels. She gave me the darkness, crazy stories, drugs, but also the Buddhism. I still have a lot of confusion about my relationship with her. Obviously, writing the book helped define it for me. When Love released a new album as Whole with an all-new band, Erlinson was shocked. He insists they had a contract barring either of them from using the whole name without the other. Obviously, I haven't sued her, he says. I've made mistakes, so I have to allow people to make what I feel is a big mistake. Huh. Are there other reasons he hasn't sued her? <laughs> Even so, Erlinson doesn't rule out a musical reunion with love. I never say never, he says. I don't know what's going to happen to her. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I like things to be open. It's all quite dark. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit here going to... I'm writing these letters to him. He's talking about Kurt now. Tapping something deep inside myself. But am I really talking to him? No, he says. At the same time, I think he would really like this book. He had a really dark sense of humor and he loved wordplay. Look at his lyrics. He would know what I'm talking about. Hmm. And again, it's very possible that Erlinson had nothing to do with Kurt Cobain's death, but he did with facts. Or maybe not Fafs either, but but again, it's just it's very convenient. If somebody else was there with him, that just they knew maybe Faf would let Erlinson in and not them if they were a stranger and it was someone else. Courtney wanted to do this deed, and perhaps Erlinson didn't even know what he was doing because if he really loved her, maybe he wouldn't have killed her. Maybe he really did just want to do one regular dose, but whoever was with them gave her the hot dose, the hot shot, and he didn't know they were going to do that. And maybe that's why he didn't even want to leave if he was there and Courtney had to go get him. I don't know. Clearly, this man is a tortured soul for what a lot of different reasons. We don't know all of them. But it is kind of weird he's trying to talk to Kurt. It's possible he had nothing to do with Kurt. But again, we keep having these guys pop up in and around Kurt who were former lovers of Courtney love. Like Callie, who happened to be in the house. I mean, that's convenient. <laughs> I mean, it's just... It's rough. It's rough. Even the guy doing the autopsy was formerly involved with Courtney. I mean, come on. This is, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. The coincidence stack, it's just, it's out of this world. Now, before I get to the darkest of the dark theories, there's a comment, uh, there was a comment on a site here. Kurt was apparently so scared of being exposed as fake and he ended up marrying one. It's a living nightmare in which he drew to himself all that he despised and feared. I really want to know why Jessica Hopper, who was apparently residing with DeWitt at Cobain's residence at the time of his supposed suicide, was never questioned at length. She said people entered and exited the house whilst she was in bed. Who were these people? What does she know? And why is she still so defensive about the events that transpired so many years later. If my good friend died in suspicious circumstances, I'd still be asking questions today and I'd be an open book about what I knew. Well, unless you were scared of certain people and you knew they were involved. It just doesn't add up. I don't know if it was Courtney, but I think there were a lot of people who were jealous of Kurt, including his old so-called friends from Olympia. I think they need to be investigated as well. That's an interesting point. People do get killed because of jealousy from former friends when one of them achieves a, a high level of success. Was there some of that going on? I don't know. I don't know if those avenues were ever pursued, but uh, that's something we didn't specifically discuss.